Hey everyone, this is Nick, and it's your favorite time of the week, the Linux and open source news time. Wait, do you mean to say that there are better things in life than this? Surely not. Anyway, this week we have the announcement of the Cosmic Desktop Alpha. It will come just after Plasma 6 releases. We've got the Linux kernel 6.7 being one of the biggest releases in recent kernel history. We have a new SteamOS based device and it's not coming from Valve and we have more stuff in the long series of Wayland Breaks Everything. And by the way, if you want these news in a daily format, please consider checking out the Patreon or becoming a YouTube member using a link in the description below. And also please consider listening to this segue to our brand new sponsor. This video is sponsored by Internext, one of the best secure, private and open source solutions for cloud storage. Internext lets you safely store and share files and photos and you know that your data is protected from prying eyes because they prioritize your privacy with end-to-end -end and zero access encryption, meaning that only you have access to your own information. Plus, they are very committed to comply with the GDPR so your data stays safe and secure. They have iOS and Android apps to let you access your files on the go and you also get automatic photo uploads. And you also have desktop clients for Linux, macOS and Windows so you can integrate Internext into your daily workflow. And on top of that, you can start with up to 10 gigs of free storage and you can upgrade to plans offering up to 10 terabytes. And right now their lifetime plans are 50% off with just one single payment. So click the link in the description below and get started with a secure private and open source cloud storage solution for all your stuff. So Cosmic is on track for an alpha release. They're apparently in the final stretch for that and the alpha will come at the end of March. Now what's remaining to fix is apparently linked to customization options and fine tuning the look and feel of the desktop. They're apparently planning to publish a Pop! OS 24.04 release over the summer with a stable version of Cosmic included. Now on top of that, Cosmic now has its terminal app with GPU rendering, desktop themes, syntax highlighting, support for left to right and right to left languages and more. They also have a custom command line utility to configure displays under Wayland and this command line utility will be the backend for their graphical settings as well. In terms of features being worked on, they're building a screenshot applet, they're working on adding hybrid graphics support to the desktop, on the ability to apply a frosted glass transparency effect and they're improving the tiling applets to bring the auto tiling features that Pop! OS users are already familiar with. Other things include designing the on-screen display elements, new wallpapers, the lock and login screen, and adding a bunch of settings. So the alpha should come at the end of March if everything goes right and I will absolutely cover that in a dedicated video because I think Cosmic could be either a very interesting new offering in the vast sea of Linux desktops or it could be just yet another thing that does the exact same thing that we already have. So it will be interesting to look at. Now, if you remember the recent post from KDE team member Nate Graham that pointed out that Wayland doesn't in fact break everything, but that apps didn't support it well, well, there's a new entry in that saga, this time from Matthias Klump, a Debian developer and KDE and GNOME member currently working for Purism. In a blog post, he points out that yes, Wayland is inevitable and yes, it does remove features that arguably should not exist in a compositor. But he also points out that Wayland is used to try and force applications to work and to be designed in a specific way and to work within a desktop specific philosophy. I guess he's talking about GNOME here, but he's not naming names. He also has an interesting point, which is that porting an app to Linux is currently not the hard part. It's supporting that app, that is. But that if developers have to choose between designing their apps exactly how they want, but being forced to use X11 because it's the only one that has the features, or using Wayland but not being able to build the app that they want, then they're probably not going to bother at all, which means that porting the app to Linux becomes the hard part and not supporting it. Matthias then lists the missing pieces like window positioning and window position saving and restoring. 
Individual window icons are also missing, but it's something I don't feel is really important as a window from an app should use the app's icon. It should not spawn a new icon for each window for legibility and clarity purposes. The general conclusion is that Wayland forces applications to work in a specific way and constrains their UX, for example, by not letting them position windows exactly how they want. So how do we solve this? Because Wayland is what we will all be using at some point. And if we want more and better apps, we need to address these concerns. So we have two ways of looking at this. Either we say that yes, Wayland should constrain applications. We want apps on Linux to work in a specific way. And in that case, we have to accept that some app developers will just not bother with Linux. Or we're saying we want as many apps as possible and we want to leave the freedom to developers to make their apps look and feel exactly how they want. And in this case, we need to implement the missing Wayland protocols, but not in the same way as X did them because that was insecure and terribly written. So we need to find another way of doing this that works well within Wayland. It's an interesting reflection. I think it just expands the comprehension of how Wayland works and the issues with it. Now the Linux kernel 6.7 was released this week and it's a big, big one. Not only by Comet size, even though it's one of the biggest set of changes, but also in terms of features. First, there's a brand new file system called bcachefs, which is meant to be very robust and very reliable, with support for encryption, snapshots, low latency, replication, and copy on write, like betterfs or zfs. It's still experimental and I'm expecting Foronix to benchmark the hell out of it to see how it compares to other options. BetterFS also gained some improvements courtesy of Valve. 6.7 also brings the much-awaited NVIDIA GSP firmware support, which lets the Nuvo drivers change the clock speed of NVIDIA GPUs, also enabling NVK, the open-source Vulkan driver, to perform adequately. You can also now disable 32-bit emulation on 64-bit kernels if you don't need that, and the kernel dropped the Intel Itanium IA64 architecture since basically no one uses that and it's pretty much unmaintained. There are also plenty of improvements to KVM for virtualizing more architectures, including RISC-V. There are improvements to Logitech input device support, there's support for AMD seamless boot on more hardware and a lot more smaller improvements. So this is the kernel version that should let people start playing around with NVK and a fully open source NVIDIA stack, which is something I'm looking forward to. So as soon as that's available, I will definitely cover it in a video. Linux Mint 21.3 was released yesterday with its headline feature being the new experimental Wayland session, the first one available for Cinnamon and Mint. There are also a few interesting additions, like right-click context menu actions that can be downloaded from an online repo to extend the features of the file manager. There are better power and sound applets, there's support for more image formats, there are new touchpad gestures for zooming in on your desktop, there's support for 75% fractional scaling, and more. The Mint apps also got a few updates, but nothing groundbreaking. Mint also now has a new repo that lets you move to an unstable version of Mint so you can test things more easily. And there's a new Edge ISO that is planned but not out yet that will embark a newer Linux kernel so you can use Mint on newer hardware since the basic version of Mint is based on an old LTS that might not run all that well on a brand new device. So I'll give Mint 21.3 a shot in a video next week and I'll mainly focus on the new Wayland session since that's the biggest change there and I think it will be interesting to see how well it works already and what is still missing. Now Fedora Azahi, the distro aimed at Apple Silicon devices, has gained a lot of good upgrades recently. You're now getting full support for HDMI output on any M1 and M2 device and you're also gaining compatibility with H.264 and DRM protected content, meaning you can play stuff from Spotify or Netflix. The GPU drivers have improved by leaps and bounds as well, now supporting OpenGL ES 3.1, meaning a lot more apps and games will now be supported, although we're still waiting on Vulkan support for better compatibility. Wi-Fi 6 and 6E are also now supported, as is the touch bar on MacBook Pros that have these. The webcam and speakers now work as well, including support for Apple's specific features for the webcam, so you can use it to its full potential. 
Battery life also got better thanks to better scheduling on the various cores of the CPU. And for the future, their goal is to implement hardware video decoding, plus support for 3D acceleration in virtual machines, so you could try and game on these devices, and also implementing support for Thunderbolt and DisplayPort Alt mode. This is really impressive progress. I guess with the speakers and the cameras now being supported, you could use Fedora Azahi as a daily driver. You're still not taking full advantage of the full potential of this device, notably with Thunderbolt and Vulcan drivers missing, but honestly, it's not far from being usable by virtually anyone. A GNOME 46 should land in about two and a half months, and so we saw the release of the Alpha for this desktop. You can expect a bunch of improvements, notably support for RDP in the login manager, so you can log in from a remote computer, or the file manager now asking to confirm the password when creating protected zip archives. The system monitor is now ported to GTK4, GNOME Tracker, the indexing service that powers the shell search, got some performance improvements, and there are plenty of other minor changes. On top of that, the window manager slash compositor called Mutter gained better profiling, so the team can identify more areas that need work to improve performance. They have simplified their X11 code, they have improved drawing tablet support by better supporting various pressure levels, and obviously there are a slew of Wayland fixes and improvements, since that's obviously going to be the focus of GNOME going forward. And in the GNOME shell, there's improved icon and text scaling, with buttons, icons, and other shell elements now scaling alongside the font scaling settings. Application search has been optimized for better results, the on-screen display elements were refined, the extensions app got a few improvements as well, and there are plenty of performance improvements and bug fixes. And I find the scaling improvements really interesting because it means that by just changing the font scaling factor, you could completely bypass the need to actually use fractional scaling in a lot of cases, which means less GPU usage, less battery usage, and less blurriness. It's all better, probably. And Mutter also received some work to support variable refresh rate. It's still experimental for now, and some things need work to have a smooth experience. But we could see variable refresh rate landing in GNOME 47, I think, which means less screen tearing and less latency when playing games. KD already supports that pretty well, so it's good to see that GNOME is also working at it to give a better experience to most people. And let's finish this with the gaming news. So first, the SteamOS devices are coming. Ionio announced their new Next Lite handheld, and it will run SteamOS, or at least a customized version of Holo ISO. That's the unofficial ISO that lets you get the exact same experience as you would get on the Steam Deck, but on any computer. It's what I currently use for my own gaming console. So Ionio apparently tweaked a few things to support the hardware, but we don't know yet what other customizations they have applied. It's interesting because Ionio announced a while back they were working on their own OS called Ionio OS. It's a Linux-based thing. But either they have canned that project, or it's just far from being ready, and they needed something that wasn't Windows, since the device doesn't seem super powerful. It will come with a Ryzen 5 4500U or Ryzen 7 4800U, which aren't bad but are definitely not super powerful. And a full-blown Windows 11 install would probably not only increase the cost, but also decrease the performance. The device will start at $299 US dollars when it releases, but we don't know when that will be yet. And that's pretty exciting. It's not as good as if it was an official partnership with Valve to bring SteamOS to more devices, but it's still good because SteamOS has absolutely the potential to be the best operating system for any gaming appliance. It has the biggest library of any console, it has less backwards compatibility problems than consoles usually face, and it's just super well designed for controller input, and also it's open source. So I hope we'll see SteamOS gaining market share and more devices implementing it, although it would be cool if it was an official partnership with Valve. Now we also got an update to the open source NVK drivers this week. And these are getting a new pipeline shader cache. This means the driver will be able to reuse the shaders that were compiled, instead of having to recompile them every time. Which obviously will reduce load times and stutters when entering new areas of a game, or just resuming a gaming session. 
In synthetic drawing tests, it reduced the time needed to complete those tests from 11 minutes down to 3, which is definitely a huge improvement. So that's one more barrier being lifted for these drivers, which is really exciting. I cannot wait to test out this new open source stack for NVIDIA. And if you enjoy getting the Epic Games free games each month, you're probably already using the Heroic Games launcher on Linux. And this thing got a new update. It now lets you automatically install various tweaks from Wine Tricks for each game that needs them, so you don't have to do anything manually yourself. And that's a great step forward to reduce the amount of research and manual work required to play some titles. It's still experimental, and the Heroic team is still building a list of games that need these tweaks to have that automatic install work well. There are also various tweaks to let you open the main window of the app by clicking the tray icon, there's better sorting of your favorites and your games with improvements to the filters, and some fixes here and there to ensure that games work well. And obviously, if you do want to play your games from the Epic Game Store, if you have any, do use Heroic Games Launcher on Linux. It is absolutely fantastic. It basically replicates the experience you can have with Proton on Steam with one-click installs and one-click plays for every single game. Well, almost every single game that will run on Linux. So really, really amazing experience here. Just like you can have an amazing experience thanks to our sponsor. Tuxedo Computers makes hardware that ships with Linux out of the box. They have laptops, ultrabooks, gaming stuff, towers, nugs, everything you might want at all price points and all power levels. All the devices are really customizable, you can pick the hardware you want, and everything is working really well with Linux. That's sort of the point of buying from Tuxedo. You can open all the laptops, you can repair them and upgrade them, you can really customize your devices with your own logo laser engraved on the lid of your laptop, your own custom keyboard layout if you want, and you also know that you're helping Linux support, because when Tuxedo encounters problems during that testing for a new device, they actually submit patches upstream so everyone can benefit from their work. And you can install any Linux distribution you want on that hardware, you're not limited to the set of distros that they offer as a pre-installed option. So if you need a new computer and you want to run Linux on it and you want to support Linux's development, click the link in the description below and get yourself a device from Tuxedo. They are really, really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you really enjoy the channel, there are plenty of links to help support it down in the video description as well. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.